What well, great promises we just sung about. Good morning. Welcome to West Point Community Church. My name is Pastor Jared. And this morning we gather as we do every Sunday as the family of God. And we recognize that we are called to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And so every week, there are, I'm sure there are things that we can rejoice about and there are difficult things that we can weep over. Uh, in terms of the rejoicing category, just so you're clear, it's my anniversary today with my wife Jennifer, so we're not weeping over that, we're rejoicing. <laughs> so 23 years, so we're thankful for the Lord's blessings there. Thank you. I know that there are other, many anniversaries happening this time of the year, and so... Uh, we want to recognize those as well. Uh, and then another category, I don't know if, you're, if this is rejoicing or weeping, uh, uh, one of our, uh, our, our next boy is going off to Bible college, so whether we rejoice or weep, we'll leave that again up to you. But Micah is off to Miller Bible College, and we'll be taking him this week, and so that's another thing coming up for us. Um, I do want to share that uh, there were some losses in our church family. In, in the bulletin, you may have seen that um, Merv Brandt lost his father this week, and so, um, but uh, loved the Lord and lived a good long life, and, and so we, re we weep and we rejoice with them. Uh, but I also did a funeral this, this past week for a little five-day-old baby boy. And so that was very sad, and so we are continuing to pray for Jake and Greta Banman as, uh, as they grieve the loss of this little one. And so that was, that was on Friday. Now, heartache reminds us of our desperate need for a Savior and a Redeemer and a Deliverer. Uh, Jesus Christ is our hope. He is our hope for today and for all eternity. Heartache and hardship also reminds us of our need for community and fellowship where we are called to bear one another's burdens and care for one another. This is what the Apostle Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We are also reminded in Scripture that we are not to grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who died and rose again, conquering sin and death and making a way for us to the Father. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. For the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress." And so let's just bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you recognizing that there are times of rejoicing and, and times of sorrow, and uh, we recognize that this past week has had that, and the week before us will have the same. And so in all of this, we do pray that uh, for those that are in sorrow, that you would bring comfort through us and through your Spirit through the reminders of the hope of eternal life in Christ. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for how you provide for us. And we ask that uh, as we prepare for this week ahead, that we will trust in you uh, regardless of the circumstances. And now, Father, as we uh, go into your word, would you guide us by your spirit? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are continuing our three-part series through the book of Jude, so you can find your way there, uh, right before the book of Revelation. Last week we introed the book, and we looked at the call to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. 
Jude has written this letter as a warning to the church to be alert and prepared for false teachers and imposters that have crept into the church and will continue to creep in to the church today. This morning we will see how Jude identifies these imposters and helps equip the church to stand against their influence in our midst. And so if you have your Bibles open, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word, Jude 5 through to verse 16. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire." Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever." It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, I recognize that's not a very cheerful passage for us this morning on a beautiful Sunday in September. We would be hard-pressed this morning to find another text of Scripture that highlights the utter darkness and devastating punishment that awaits the ungodly that reject the grace and authority of our great God. And yet, this is in our Scriptures, and it is for us to teach and correct and reproof. And so here we go. This is a sobering passage reminding the church and all that have ears that God is a God of justice. He does oppose the proud and gives grace to the humble. Jude 5 through 16, what I just read, builds on the introduction of verses 3 and 4. And so please look again at those verses. Jude calls the believers to contend for the faith, knowing that certain people have crept in unnoticed, who pervert the grace of God and deny the authority of Christ as Lord and Savior and King. As a reminder from last Sunday... These imposters are not born-again believers 
that have differing views of orthodox theology, orthodox being approved or accepted traditional views. Rather, these are unbelievers devoid of the Spirit. We see this in verse 19. They are wolves amidst sheep who whisper deception and doubt. We must remember and and think of the serpent in the Garden of Eden that deceived Eve, causing her to question the words of God and undermine God's authority. These spiritual imposters are similar. They have rejected God's authority. They have become an authority unto themselves, seeking to lead astray others in their deceitful schemes. The Apostle Paul speaks of these individuals elsewhere when he wrote to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. And so in light of this clear and present danger, Jude writes to alert the church and call them to wake up and be on guard. He reminds the church of the judgment that will come upon these corrupted leaders and influencers. As we get into verses 5 through 7, you'll see that Jude recalls three stories of rebellion and judgment. First of all, he begins with referencing Israel as a nation who were rescued from slavery in Egypt, but who grumbled against the Lord. Notice Jude mentions Jesus' name here who not only saved a people out of Egypt, but also destroyed those who did not believe. Some biblical scholars may want to reject Jude's placement of Jesus in Egypt and in the wilderness, but I would recommend that we submit to the inspiration and authority of God's word by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul places Jesus there as well. We see this in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so again, this speaks of Christ's presence as well as his provision and then later his judgment that came upon those who responded in unbelief and rebellion. Jude tells us that they were destroyed because they did not believe. They lacked faith and they grumbled against the very one who rescued them and provided for them. Jude is sharing this to remind his hearers of what awaits those who grumble toward God and reject his authority. The next story is an interesting story of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the angels who left their proper dwelling. According to Jewish literature and tradition, this alludes to this story we find in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, where we read that the sons of God took daughters of man and bore children of renown also called or referred to as mighty men or as giants. Now, there is much debate here among Christians. One of the questions that comes from this story is, were these angels who were procreating with women? Some say yes, some say no. But what we do know is that Jude references the writings of 1 Enoch, which is not in our scriptures, And it is there that we are given additional information that points to the angel interpretation. Jude points to this story to show the wickedness and the rebellion of the angels who abandoned their proper dwelling and function and disobeyed against God's created order and design. Jude reminds the reader that these angels are kept in chains until judgment day. 
So that's the second story. And that seems to remind Jude of another story of rejecting God's sexual design. He references the events leading up to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah for the wicked act of homosexuality that was celebrated and sought after. As we know, God created man, male and female, and called them to be fruitful and multiply. So Jude reminds his readers of the fate of the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 7, we read that because they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, they now serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So after these three examples of rebellion and judgment, Jude says that these spiritual imposters operate in like manner. Verse 8, they rely on dreams and they defile the flesh. They reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. With regard to dreams, I believe the reason Jude condemns this behavior is because these dreams or visions or prophecies had become their ultimate authority. In their minds, they, they have special extra revelation and therefore are now no longer confined to God's word and his authority. There are many warnings of these types of individuals in scripture. Let me share one. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass... So even if this is true, <clears throat> and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall purge the evil from your midst. Again, these are sobering words. Because they reject God's authority, they pervert the grace of God, verse 4, and they operate from a place of ignorance and arrogance. Jude shares another interesting story here regarding the body of Moses and of Michael the archangel and the devil fighting over it. This story is not found in our Bibles. This is another story from Jewish writings called the Testament of Moses. Now we can <clears throat> discuss some of those things, uh, but we don't, I don't think we need to get too caught up with all of that. I, I think we need to understand what the point of this story is for Jude and for us today. Jude is making this point that even Michael, a created being with great authority, with great power, he did not operate outside of his proper place as a servant of God. He remained under authority. And so he contrasts the example of Michael with these imposters that are both ignorant and arrogant. They are fools who are walking in the way of Cain and the error of Balaam and the rebellion of Korah. And do we know these stories? Jude uses three examples of arrogant men who forsook God's ways and were punished severely. Again, we won't have too much time on each of these, uh, but the, first of all, the way of Cain. Cain is forever famous for being both the first child of Adam and Eve and the first murderer who killed his brother Abel out of envy. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 3, 11 and 12, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, 
who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And so the way of Cain is envy. Secondly, we have Balaam's error. Balaam's error was greed and idolatry, and it led to a severe plague upon Israel. We read this in the book of Numbers. For example, Numbers 31.16 is a summary. Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. Balaam was destroyed in battle as his punishment. Thirdly, Korah's rebellion. You can turn with me to Numbers chapter 16 because I will read a passage from there. That is where we find this rebellion. Korah, along with several others, gathered with them 250 men and rose up against Moses and Aaron. They rejected their authority. They sought to remove them from their place. And so God told Moses and Aaron what to do. They were told to to separate all the people from this group that had come against them. And let me read beginning in verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die as all men die... Or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly and all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for they said, lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. And so again, these are sobering words. These are sobering stories. They are full of severe condemnation and punishment. And so again, why does Jude bring all of these stories back to back to back to back? He uses these stories to remind us today that wolves in sheep's clothing will not go unpunished. In the meantime, the church is to be on guard against those that creep in unnoticed. And so, it's one thing to say that this morning, but it's another thing to say, well, well, who is the enemy then? And so let me help you by giving you what I believe to be a a real and great threat today in our churches. I believe one of the biggest threats to the church today is something called progressive Christianity or progressive theology. Progressive Christianity comes into the church under the guise of love and care for all. It sounds really good, But in their case, the definition of love and care are defined not by God and his word, but by our ever-changing culture. It is, a, it is a worldview that values being nice as the ultimate virtue and sacrifices truth on the altar of love and acceptance and tolerance. <clears throat> so I'm going to share a couple quotes from the Christian website gotquestions.org. I find that website to be a helpful resource. And so this is, you have to put on your thinking caps here. So let me read through these. Progressive theology's priority 
of conforming to contemporary social values over the Bible signals a sharp departure from orthodox approaches to Christian doctrine. So orthodox is approved, accepted approaches. And progressive theology goes against that. Progressive theology replaces scripture as the standard for faith and practice with with modern liberal ideals like tolerance, relativism, and sustainability. Progressive theology enthrones subjective personal feelings. As a result, love, compassion, and justice, as progressive theology defines those terms, don't exist alongside truth, righteousness, and orthodoxy, but to override and supplant them. And so you can, ex- you can see the, the battle, the exchange of meaning in progressive theology or progressive Christianity. Next quote, convoluted or twisted or warped rejections of clear biblical teachings about sin, gender, sexuality, salvation, sanctity of life, family, morality, scripture, and so forth are not progress toward truth. Neither does a reinterpretation of scripture represent an evolution of truth. Truth does not progress or develop. It exists, and we either come closer to it or drift further away. Okay? If you think of the word progress, there's movement there. So where, where are we moving to or where are we moving away from? I believe in progressive Christianity, we hear the whispers of wolves. And they whisper to us, did God really say? Is God really good? They're whispers of doubt. Doubting God's goodness and love and grace and mercy. Doubting that God is holy and just. Doubting the authority of his word. Doubting the exclusivity of salvation through faith in Christ alone. And if these doubts come in and if they set in to a person's life and heart, All of these doubts lead to exactly what we've read this morning, grumbling and rebellion and the perversion of the grace of God. I believe a progressive Christian looks like a Christian, often speaks like a Christian, but their love for the approval of the world will reveal their inward state. I say that because of what we read in James 4 verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so I believe a choice is before us. It is before the church. It has always been before us. Will we heed the voice of God or the whisper of wolves? Let's recall what our true shepherd proclaims. These are the words of Jesus. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we must contend for the faith by hearing and following the voice of our great shepherd. We must hold on to the gospel once for all delivered to the saints. And in a world where progressive Christianity is creeping in, this will require courage and conviction for us as believers.
Courage to proclaim Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. We must have the conviction of Acts 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We must have the joy and perseverance of Acts 5, 40 to 42. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them to speak in the name of Jesus no longer and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Jesus is our true and great shepherd. It is his voice we must hear and listen and follow. And so let us have courage and conviction to follow Christ, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. And may the voice of truth prevail over the whisper of wolves. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness and your goodness to us that you've given to us, granted to us through your Son. We thank you that he is our rock. He is the anchor for us. Father, as we recognize the dangers that are around us, the progressive thought that creeps in. I pray that we would be better equipped to see it, to stand against it, and that by your Spirit, you would give us boldness and courage and conviction to stand on the truth that is your Word and that is your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this church that has made a commitment to uphold your teachings, whatever the cost may be. And so may you be honored and glorified in this body and in each one as we take up the call to deny ourselves and follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.